Later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralysed man, carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up. He took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Thank you so much, David, and thank you again for the opportunity to be able to come and share God's Word with you this morning. Before we start, um, we, uh, we're going to start with a, a brief video from the, uh, the team in Malawi uh, who are, are working with the people group called the Yows. So can we have that video now? Thank you. I'm Tim Downs, and I'm part of a team of global interaction, intercultural workers based here in Malawi in Africa. It's a very, very exciting time of the year in Malawi, December, because that's when the rain's coming. You see the new growth and the, and the green and the maize growing and, and it looks like, looks like we're gonna have a good crop this year. I guess what I'm really excited about is the growth in some of the faith communities. Just wanna tell you a story about a young fellow whose name is Dalton. He, um, he came to the Lord about two years ago. We baptized him and we've been discipling him intentionally for that last little while. Just last week, sitting up in his village, it was the time that we'd organized where he was gonna take the Bible study. So the week before he chose a passage of scripture himself, something out of Ezekiel, and he, he said he read it every night, praying that God would reveal to him something to share. So the day came and here's this young fella, sitting there quite nervous. His wife was sitting beside him, a bit embarrassed about his foray into the, into the realm of teaching. There was a group of people, 20 or 30 people, and Dogu started unpacking what he believed God was sharing and teaching him and the group from this passage of scripture. It was in his village, it was in his language, and it was in his culture. And I just sat there as the missionary who'd been coming out to this place for about eight years. And I was being fed the word of God by this young fellow. You know, I couldn't have been prouder, hey? And at the end, I just shared in front of him, but in front of the group, I said, you know, I've been coming out here for so long, feeding you guys. But today, you guys were feeding me. You know, this is a big milestone for any global interaction intercultural worker. Just to see the people that we're discipling into actually taking the banner and recognising, you know what, it's now our job to teach our people. That's a bit of what's happening here in Malawi. We're seeing that in, in the adult literacy program. We're seeing that in some of the translation work. We're seeing that in our youth group. We're seeing that in our kids clubs. We're seeing that in our faith communities in the village. Local believers rising up and, and doing what they believe God has called them to do, of sharing the kingdom in their culture. You know, we've got new people coming over and it's gonna look a bit different for these guys. They're not the main people, but they actually support and work alongside the main people. We, we're intentionally becoming more support people. It's very exciting, it's very encouraging. And uh, it's, ex it's an exciting time to be a part of the team there in Malawi. But all of this is premised on the fact that over 30 years, Global Interaction have had people working this area amongst the Yows. There's been many barriers that have been over, have had to be overcome so that these people can start to come to faith and grow in their faith 
and now start to lead faith communities. So today we're looking at overcoming barriers. Let's pray before we come to God's Word. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds. Help us to understand, to receive your Word, and Lord, not just to be hearers of your Word, but to be doers. We pray this in your name. Amen. As we've already mentioned about the people there in uh, in uh, Malawi, the Owls, we've talked about the sense that they are a Muslim group. What I haven't told you about is the reason why they are a Muslim group. Part of the reason why they are also a least reached people group comes from that background. During that horrible time in human history, the slave trade era, the Owl people sided with the slave traders the Arab slave traders. And so as they, they uh, profited off the suffering of their fellow African tribal people groups around them, they became marginalised over time in history because of that division. And that division's never properly been healed. There is still long-held uh, barriers between them. So even though... There, it is a substantially Christian country with over 80, 85% claiming uh, allegiance to Jesus. The Owl people, the third largest group, there is not a, there's not really been a significant people group movement for Jesus. We're still waiting for that to happen. And that's only going to happen while, uh, while uh, people like Dobu that's been talked about there will be raised up and will lead his people as people come to faith and they share their faith amongst the owls and healing some of these long-held divisions. That's what makes this exciting. So it's not 30 years that Global Interaction have been there. It's not the 100 years or more since Christian Mission has been there. But there is this barrier of culture. There is this barrier of divisions. There is a barrier to be overcome. But that's what mission has always been about. Today we've heard this story of a man who was paralysed, couldn't walk. There was a barrier for this man to overcome so that he could not only be healed, but he could be, have his sins forgiven and become a follower of Jesus. There is this sense of division. So for us to understand how those barriers were overcome, and what they say to us in our context, in our situation here in form, is the essence of what we want to talk about today. The f best way to do that is to understand this story. And to understand the story, we need to understand the context. Mark's Gospel is an often preached book by preachers. We love it. It's shorter than the rest. It uh, is often more graphic and is a great picture uh, for us to be able to tell such a story. And so indeed, even though this is still early in the book of Mark, by chapter 2, Jesus has already established his ministry. He's teaching ministry. He's already out there. He's getting a reputation amongst the, uh, the rest of, the, uh, of uh, the, the Jewish people about his ministry. So indeed, when he comes back to Capernaum, we are uh, uh, told uh, that... Um, this is at least, most likely, his base for this period of ministry. It's, uh, it's often seen in, in chapter 2, verse 1, this returning, is returning to this place of, of, uh, of refuge. But he doesn't get much refuge, does he? People come, there is this crowded house. And similarly, at this point in time, we have the presence of the teachers of the law. His popularity is growing. Capernaum is, is a, away from some of the, the rest of the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, religious authorities, but they've found him and they come and check him out. This is the essence of why they are, they are there. But at, the, but at the heart of this encounter is the story of a paralyzed man. A paralyzed man and his four friends. So how do you get a paralyzed man to Jesus so that he can meet Jesus, he can hear Jesus, he can be healed? 
and to have his sins forgiven. It, part, of the, part of this situation is that the stories of his healing powers have obviously already circulated. And indeed, in Mark 1, we know that such is his reputation at this point in time, he cannot even enter a town openly. And thus, this house that he is in is crowded because of that growing popularity. But that did not stop this paralyzed man and his friends from seeing Jesus. The man and his friends had some significant barriers to overcome. And the first indeed was he was paralyzed. He could not get to the house, uh, from his house to uh, the house where Jesus is without some assistance. This required a coordinated effort by his friends, some teamwork so that they could get him to the house. Then we saw that they had the, the crowd in uh, small places. Crowds get in the way in being able to get up the front. They saw the obvious dilemma. They had to then dig through the roof. That is their solution and, and get him to Jesus. Unfortunately, we spend a lot of time as Christians, don't we, working out the mechanics of this. What type of roof was it? How d busy was it? Did they have to get a jackhammer? I don't think they had one of those. But uh, nevertheless, they had to come up with some plan to get through the roof. But I don't know about you, but I would have to overcome another barrier of my own. Because when I was brought up, I didn't dig through somebody else's roof. I didn't destroy their property. Somehow they had to overcome those barriers. But there was also the story in the story, the story of the religious leaders. Were they there to really listen to Jesus? Were they there really there to check him out or trip him up? Are they honest inquirers? Uh, what, is, what is going on there for them? They thought it was blasphemous that Jesus could claim to forgive sins. That was only something God could do. All of these were significant barriers that had to be overcome. But Jesus was always and still is about overcoming those barriers to faith. Indeed, as significant as this miracle was in healing the paralyzed man, we know Jesus performed many more than just this one miracle. Many more. Some of them are recorded. In fact, we know so many happened that they couldn't all be recorded in our scriptures. And even with all of those amazing miracles and things that Jesus did, the ultimate nature of his ministry was not just about the miracles themselves. Indeed, if it was, then you'd have to say it was a failure because there were still sick people in Israel. And there are still sick people here today. Many of us cry out for that healing. But ultimately, the, the, the miracles in, in and of themselves were pointing to what God ultimately was going to be doing. His plan of salvation. The, the miracles themselves pointed to what the kingdom would be like. The sin, the sadness, the brokenness of this world will one day pass when we're with Jesus. That's the ultimate game. But Jesus came and he came and challenged those religious authorities in their preconceived ideas. He came and challenged them. In, in so important was this part of his ministry. The very next story we have in Mark chapter 2 is when Jesus goes and he sits and he eats with notorious sinners, depending on what translation you have. And... Tax collectors. But let's not get deviated from the story. He was about shaking up the establishment, showing them what God was on about and what God's ultimate uh, kingdom would look like. Who was acceptable to the kingdom of God? Even the paralyzed man, even those sinners, even those tax collectors were ultimately acceptable in the kingdom of God. Here they came through Jesus. Jesus faced many barriers, just as we face barriers when we go to Malawi today, in terms of bringing the good news to the lost. 
in terms of a intercultural worker, in terms of another culture, what are the barriers? We've already alluded to some of those barriers in sharing the good news with the Yao and Southern Malawi. The first obvious one for someone like myself is I can't even speak the language. Um, in fact, with our ministry, our primary role is to teach in English at the, at the college. We go into a country that has 13 significant tribal groups and uh, many of those students come from different tribal groups. So which language would you teach them anyhow? So, um, and there's a number of issues that we have to deal with. So we've, with language is a significant issue. The language of the Yao people is Chiao. So as a Western missiologist, as somebody that goes into that sort of culture, many of our first-term missionaries will spend the first two or three years of their uh, time there just learning the language and learning the culture. Because again, it is very, very easy to make mistakes when you don't understand the language and the culture. It's, it's even far more complex, as I was um, talking to Ben before the service, with 13 significant tribal groups. What do they get taught in school? Many of the kids learn their mother tongue, the, the language of their, their tribe, from when they're a babe, just like you and I learned our English. Many of you would have learned English like I did from my mum. And uh, in that sense, that's what we are familiar with. Many of the students will be taught English, probably just the same way as you learnt French or Japanese or something else in your schooling background. And if I tried to have a conversation with you in French, the language I learnt, I won't get much past uh, bonjour and maybe au revoir. How would you like to come to theological college and try to study in French <laughs> or German? Uh, our students come to the college and they're meant to learn in English because that's the body of literature they have. Now, they learnt English at school, but obviously learn reading Spurgeon or, or uh, some of the other greats of, uh, of theology and, um, and preaching is a little bit harder. That's one of the barriers. So when Australian Baptists decided to reach out to the marginalised Yao people group, it meant a great commitment not only by Baptists but the individual missionaries that would go and learn that language, do the hard yards, just like Tim. Uh, he's, we've met him on a number of occasions. Inspirational, but he's been at it for 15 years and they're just starting to see these growing communities of faith emerge. Exciting times, but not without a lot of commitment and hard work of overcoming the barriers that are there. I remember very much so some of these personal barriers in communication when I my let me give you this uh, background. My first profession was as a mining engineer and engineers, we like to get things done. So one of the very first frustrations I had when uh, we were in Malawi was you would sit down with other faculty members or others in the community and there's, we, we, we talked about it, it's, it's almost like a talk around. It's, 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 you talk about just about anything else other than the real thing that you come there for. It's a time of when you build up confidence with the person that you're talking with. And ultimately, they'll get around to the final thing. So often, the last three or four minutes of a conversation is the most significant when you sort out what's actually going to happen. But you have to hang in there for the rest of that conversation. And that can be really frustrating. But it's part of their culture. You see, in that sense, culture is another barrier that's not so much needs to be overcome, but it needs to be understood and it needs to be navigated if we're going to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people, to train them, to equip them. And ultimately, as our cross-cultural ministries uh, tell us, as they need to, uh, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So how do we overcome barriers? Well, I love the story because it talks about four friends. Um, the lost sheep said four fabulous friends, and they certainly were fabulous. 
they actually work together to uh, to to reach this to get this paralyzed man to Jesus, and that's a picture of of teamwork. And churches are all about teamwork, aren't they? This morning didn't happen. We were here at about quarter to nine, and you already had about five or six people in here preparing for the service. Many of us just like coming at five to ten and sitting down. But lots of things happen, and afterwards we'll get a cup of tea, and things will be washed up, and all of that. Teamwork is what the church should be about. We know that teamwork works. Ultimately for us in Malawi, it's partnering with our colleagues at the Baptist Theological Seminary of Malawi. You see, what's really good about what we are able to go and do, even though we probably still only have a rudimentary understanding of their language, or one of their common languages, I should say, even though we will uh, we'll still get to know a little more about their culture, even if we're there for four or five years, we still will be beginners in their culture. We'll have a better understanding. But the people that we leave, bes- leave behind, the students that we've trained, the students that have been hopefully inspired to preach the Word of God, that understand their Old Testament a little bit better, that they will go and take those skills because they know the language, they know the skills, uh, they know the, the, the country, and they will be able to share more effectively that good news. That's what's important about teamwork, as God's people work together to get His mission done. And so we partner with churches, just like Forbes, around uh, New South Wales, to go and to do what many of us can't just hop on a plane at the moment. It's getting even harder just to hop on a plane to go and do that. But we are meant to complete our work. The mission of God is both here locally in the local church, but also is, is globally across the world. So the question I want to leave you thinking about, as we've talked about overcoming barriers to faith, what are the barriers that you face while you are here in Forbes? What are those barriers? Well, we may start to think that the person walking down the street, sometimes we might even think about the person just across the fence. And sometimes they look like us. Sometimes they might even sound like us. They may even speak the same language as us. But what's going on for that neighbour? Shirley and I had a bit of a rude awakening um, <laughs> a number, probably about 18 months ago. We uh, got up, and we're normally fairly early risers. Maybe some of you farmers don't think it's early getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, but in town, that's what we think. And uh, as, we, uh, as we went out the back door, there was um, four or five young lads. I'm not quite sure how. They were in their 18 to 30-odds. And they were on the back lawn of our neighbour's property and they were chipping golf balls into the Macquarie River at six o'clock in the morning. Well, it makes a lot more sense when you start to understand the drug culture that is part and parcel of Wellington. And uh, if you wanted to hear the rest of the story, I'll tell you that after over a cup of tea. But for us, it might have shook us up. Even though they look like us, they talk like us, Something else was going on for them. But unless I take the time to understand them, how can I share the good news of Jesus Christ with them, with any sense of sincerity? I don't know about you, but occasionally I turn the radio on and sometimes I get the, uh, the talkback radio session. And sometimes you almost want to pick up the radio and throw it through the window. Some of the crazy views and ideas and that sometimes come. Sometimes you'll agree with it. But some of the craziest people are often the people that phone in as well. But you know what? If I'm going to share the good news of Jesus Christ, however crazy their views may seem to you or I, I've got to understand where they're coming from for me to be able to share them the good news of Jesus Christ. We have to overcome those barriers. I don't know if uh, the guys on my neighbour's back lawn were really looking to, uh, to, to overcome those barriers to us. They were more interested in getting the ball into the river. 
that's part of our story about what the church here exists for is to overcome those barriers of weakness even for those that aren't quite yet looking for Jesus Christ and sometimes when I hear that story in Malawi of the, uh, the our organization our, our mission our cooperative work as Baptists 30 years and what has been achieved well certainly a few lives have been saved and things are starting to emerge you say it's it's a lot of hard work but that's what mission often is it's not an overnight success it's often investing in people and lives and building relationships and that can take a huge amount of time huge amount of time i want to share one last story with you and it comes out of my own personal experience in uh, in Wellington. Living in um, in country towns, we have some interesting characters at times come across our path. Probably one of the most difficult of those characters gave me a call only a couple of months ago. And uh, he phoned up and he asked me, what do I have to do to get my girlfriend baptized you know what were the physical things what do i need to do to make sure it's done properly in that sense but i've got to say i hadn't met that guy for probably 10 15 years i hadn't seen him for a long time but he took the time to phone us and ask for some advice and i don't know about you but if you're in ministry for any period of time and you've shared your faith with others it's one of those God sends that come along, that you're reminded that some of that hard work that we do time and time again doesn't always seem to bring up the fruit that we're looking for instantaneously. We live in a world that wants instantaneous success. But often ministry is long, hard years of hanging in there with some relationships that do not always seem to show fruit. But God calls us. Because the kingdom is much bigger than you or I. God has a love for this world. And he's chosen us to be people that can trade that love to this world. So today we've talked a bit about Malawi and Mozambique. What I want to focus you guys on as we finish today is what is the mission that God is calling you individually and corporately as the Forbes Baptist Church. What is he calling you to do? As we go to Malawi, we ask you to pray for us because we know we need your prayers and we know it's beyond us, but it's not beyond God. And so as we go to Malawi, as the Lord brings you guys into our minds, we will also pray for you in that long, hard yards of what ministry looks like in, uh, in Forbes. So as we conclude today, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, Lord, you are the God that overcomes barriers, overcomes our doubts, overcomes our weaknesses. Lord, you enabled this, this man 2,000 years ago to be healed, restored and renewed. And so, Lord, I pray for the people of Forbes. Lord, I pray for those outside of this building, out of this, outside of this church community, Lord, that still need to hear the good news. Lord, whether it's in the local schools, and Lord, we, we thank you for that encouraging story from David out at Pajerobong, Lord, and, uh, and being able to proclaim the news to those kids. So, Lord, we pray for our SRE teachers, and we pray, Lord, for each and every one of the members of this church that, Lord, you will give them the tenacity, the encouragement, Lord, to continue on, to share their faith in season and out of season. Lord, bless this church for your kingdom's sake, we pray. Amen.